of the Brother Shabar Mahdi. Um, just a short introduction on him. Um, he's currently studying Islamic sciences uh, and he regularly lectures and teaches on various Islamic topics. Um, he's appeared on several Islamic TV channels and he also translates and writes on various issues, including uh, Quranic legislation, philosophy, Raja'ah, and the various dimensions of Qawbi. His interests lie in Islamic theology, Usul al Fiqh, and the Twelfth Imam. Today he will be giving a speech on the myth of the apocalyptic wars. So without further ado, I'd like you to welcome Brother Shabbat Mahdi with a loud salam. Certain countries 
And these wars will then cause the death and the destruction of all of the people in, inhabiting this earth. In other words, all of those good individuals that brought good to this world, that they would be destroyed. And all of those unjust, inhumane people that brought bad into this world, they would also die and also be destroyed. In other words, there would be no just system because this Allah, this punishment, would be brought on all of the people of the world. This apocalypse this is something which is the revelation of something which is hidden and usually denotes the destruction of the world. Primarily as Muslims, especially as Shia Muslims, we turn our faces away from any uh, type of apocalyptic war theory. That, for example, this world will end with both good and bad being destroyed. Without any justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And primarily the reason why we believe in this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that before Qiyama there are many stages. Before that, Imam Mahdi ajallahu ta'ala for a sharif will rise. In other words, people may be worrying at home, watching the news and look, this, uh, this country is about to uh, start war with this country, World War Three. And one thing I'll also say is the internet plays a very bad role in this. For the internet, one Mawlana said that the internet people take more important than wahi. Whatever they read on the internet, they accept. Whatever they read. And so some people uh, start sending emails about, for example, the end of the world, and people begin getting worried. But we as Shia Muslims, we're not worried. We're sitting at home thinking, I know that the world will not end unless my Imam comes. And when he comes, he won't just kill endlessly. Some people think that the Imam will kill all the non-Muslims. No, first the Imam will ask. That I am from the progeny of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I bring Islam. This Islam that Abraham and Noah, Noah and Adam, Ishaq, all of the prophets fought. I am bringing this Islam. Do you accept? If they say yes, they come into the army of the Imam. If they say no, then the, the matter goes on. But it's not merciless killing of people as some people think. For the Imam is a bringer of peace, not removal of peace on this earth. Many times we hear many stories and rumors from different people. Many ahadith are thrown at people and they scare some believers. However, we as true followers of the Imam, we need to understand that there is one thing. If we have this one thing, no matter what rumors are spread, no matter how many people talk about the apocalypse, if we have this one thing, we're okay. And that is Ma'rifah of Imam Zaman Ajillah Ta'ala Fawajah Masham. For Ayyullah Wahid Khurasan, I'm sure you've all heard of Allah, he says that in order to see the sun, the physical sun, you need two things. In order to see this physical sun, the first thing you need is eyes which are able to see. The second thing you need is you should not have a covering on your eyes. For if your eyes are able to see perfectly, but you have a covering, you won't be able to see the sun. He says, in the same way to see the son of Ali Muhammad, you need two things. You need eyes. Which eyes? The eyes of thought and reason. And you need to not have the covering of sin. In other words, when we hear these rumors that the world will end, that there will be tyranny, that there will be destruction, we need to understand that once we remove sins from our life, once we cleanse our souls, we will gain ma'rif of the Imam. Once we gain ma'rif of the Imam, how many rumors are spread, they won't affect us. Because the more we sin, the more veils are put over our eyes, the further we become from the Imam. There was another great scholar, Ayatollah Falsabi. Ayatollah Falsabi was uh, taught by Ayatollah Khoi, and he was, he was teaching in Tehran, and then he was called to teach in Mashhad by Ayatollah Hadi Milani, Rahmatullah and he was a grand scholar in Mashhad and he passed away, I think, in 2006. Ayatullah Falsafi says that the body, there are two ways within which this body can be nourished. Two means. The first is the mouth, I eat. The second is the nose. For example, some children when they're unwell, they're given food through their nose. He says, in the same way that there are two ways within which the body can be nourished, there are two ways within which our souls can be nourished. The first is the eyes, the second is the ears. For I can look at something, I can look at an alim, I can look at the Kaaba, I can look at the holy shrines of the Ma'asumin, the Salam, I can read the Quran, I'm nourishing my soul. I can listen to Quran, I can listen to Dua. 
I can listen to things that are holy and I nourish my soul. In order to understand the Iman, we need to protect these two things specially. Especially. And we need to understand and gain ma'rifah of what is right. So when these people talk about apocalypse, when these people talk about 2012, the world is going to end. We understand that because we, as Muslims and, and as believers, have ma'rifah of the Iman, we're not worried about what they're talking about. During the Battle of Jamal, someone came to Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they, he asked, he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, we are fighting the wife of the Holy Prophet. Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, we are fighting companions who we thought were on the right path. We are fighting companions who were known to be on path. The Imam replied, do not identify haq by certain personalities. Understand what haq is first, those personalities will automatically come. In other words, to understand Imam Mendi, understand the truth, understand human values, understand piety, automatically the Imam will come. There will be no more confusion left in your hearts when people will rise up and say, we are the sons of Imam Mendi, or we are Imam Mendi. Once you understand what haq is, once you direct your heart totally towards the Imam, that is when you regain ma'afah. There's a beautiful story. Narrated of a grocer in Basra. He was in Basra, he was a grocer, and he had love for the Imam. He had love for the Imam, but not Marifa. He had love for his, his Imam. He had directed his heart partially towards the Imam, not fully, partially. One day, at his grocery shop, two individuals came that looked like they were not from that area, and they asked for camphor, car food. He says, look, I'll give it to you, but tell me one thing. Where are you from? They said, look, this is nothing to do with you. Give us this camphor and let us go. He said, no, I want to know where are you from? Where have you come from? You look different. They said, look, all we want from you is this camphor. Give it to us so that we can go. He consisted and consisted and consisted until he said, by Imam Zaman, tell me who you are. These two people said, look, you cannot tell anyone, but we are those special servants of the Imam. For the Imam has a global team of servants, of helpers. We are two of those. We are buying camphor because one of the true faithful servants of Imam Mehdi has passed away. And we are buying camphor to do? Awesome. As soon as this grocer heard, his eyes changed, his whole state changed. He said, you know the Imam? They said, yes, we know the Imam. He said, take me to see the Imam, please. He said, will he be at that funeral? They said, yes, he'll be at that funeral, but we can't take you. Not everyone can see the Imam. He pleaded and pleaded and pleaded and pleaded until they said, fine, we'll take you, but there's no guarantee. If the Imam says he'll see you, he'll see you. If he says no, you have to go. Of course, he, he was happy, so he followed those two. He followed those two, and in Basra, you'll find that there's a sea. These two, as they got to the sea, they began walking on water. This grocer, he remained behind. They began walking on water. After a while, they looked back. They said, what are you doing? Come with us. He said, I can't walk on water. He said, yes, you can. Say, Ya Sahib al-Zaman. So he says, Ya Sahib al-Zaman, and he's able to walk on water. As they get to the middle of this ocean, this sea, a cloud covers the whole of Basra, and immediately there is heavy rain. Heavy rain covers the whole, the, the whole city. This grocer remembers something. He remembers that on the rooftop of his shop, he had kept soap and detergent. He was thinking, I have a lot of soap there. I need to sell that. Now it's raining. It's all going to disintegrate. I'm going to lose a lot of money. That one thought caused him to fall into the water and start drowning. They looked at him. They said, what are you doing? Say, yes, I was the man. He said, yes, I was the one. Back again, he was walking they walked, they walked, they walked, they walked, they got to an island. Now these two helpers, they said, look, you wait here. You see that tent over there? We're going to enter that tent. The Imam is in that tent. We'll ask him whether he will allow you, uh, us, uh, allow, uh, us to uh, take you to him. If he says no, you have to turn back. He says, okay. These two, they entered this tent. This grocer says, I could see that this tent was filled with light. These two came back. They said, the Imam says he will not see you. He said, why? He said, because you are Rajul and Sabur. 
because you are so individual. You don't care about the imam. You thought about soap, you thought about your merchandise. Because you thought about this word and materialism and your merchandise and tijara, Imam Zaman will not see you. In other words, if you want to see the Imam, if you want to gain makhlif of the Imam, if you want to remove any of these apocalyptic wall theorems, make sure you direct your heart completely towards the Imam. Imam comes first, everything else comes after. And that's why when we find, we hear these stories that the world will end. We hear these stories that, for example, the world will self-destruct itself. We understand that there are three periods which will occur. Three stages before Imam Zaman, before the world and Three stages, very quickly. The first stage, as we know, is the whole of Imam Zaman of Allah Abdullah Allah Abdullah Abdullah Sharif. It is mentioned within many books. The resemblance of Imam Zaman to the Anbiya. There's loads of chapters written on this. One small glimpse that Nabi Saleh, Allah, Nabi Saleh, he went into occultation from his people. And when he went into occultation, he was fair, he had a thick beard, he was nice weight, he looked in a certain distinctive way. He went into occultation from his people. When he came back, when his Zuhur occurred after a while, there were three, three groups of people that existed. The first group, they denied his existence completely. The second group, they were unsure whether he existed, whether that was Saleh or whether that was someone else. The third group had complete faith in Nabi Saleh. And Saleh said to them, look, I am Saleh, I am angry, I am proud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said, what's your proof? And he gave his proof. And those that were firm in belief, they went with him. The other two, they were left. Well, Imam say in the same way that Saleh had three groups of people when he uh, uprose, in the same way, Imam Mehdi will have three groups of people. Now we need to decide, are we those that completely deny the Imam, inshallah not? Are we those that are shaky about the Imam's existence? Some people, maybe when they see him, they think, I imagined him to look different. I imagined him to be in this way or that way. Or are we one of those people that has firm belief in the Imam? And there are beautiful narrations that the Imam will be sitting under a tree. And a man, an individual will come. He'll be sitting under this tree, an individual will come. And this individual will be from a certain tribe and he will say, why are you sitting under this tree? Why is it that you're sitting under this tree? He'll say, look, I need to go to Makkah in the night. Currently the weather is very hot. Once the night time comes, I will shall go to Makkah. This person will then smile. When he smiles, the Imam will realize that this person is actually Jibra'il. They will hug each other and Jibra'il will call Barak. Imam Mahdi will then sit on Barak and will be taken to a mountain known as the Ghazba Mountain. On that mountain, he will see two eminent personalities. The first person he will see is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The second person he see will be uh, Amir al Mu'minin sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wa they will write a pledge and give it to Imam Mahdi al Jilal or Jaish Khalif, and the Imam will then be taken to Makkah, where of course we know he will lean on Rukun Yamani and say the verse I quoted at the beginning, but they will not have a in Kundun Mu'minin, and he will read that pledge written. By Rasulullah and This is the first say that we understand is the Dhuhr. And you've heard many times, and I'm going to bore you with Allah Mahd of the Lord, the signs, etc. And there's a lot that can be said of this, but we're moving on very quickly. The second statement comes is very interesting. The second stage is known as Raja'ah. Raja'ah primarily is not a fundamental Islamic belief. Ayatullah Khoi was asked, Do we have to believe in Raja to be Muslim? He said, No. But there is no harm in believing in this concept. Raja, this concept, Raja means to return. Marja, Raja, all the same root words. Raja means to return. Raja is the return of two types of people. The first is those that were very pious, those that were very religiously orientated, such as the companions of the Ahlul Bayt. So they will return. The first, the second people that will return would be those that had no human values, their hearts were made of stone. All they did in their lives was sin. 
In other words, the best people will return and the worst people will return in Hajra. As the Quran says, we'll give you life twice and death twice. They will return as will each one of the Imams and they will die a natural death. They will die a natural death. For it is said within narration that Imam Hussain sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he will have Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Within Raja, he will rule for Sodom on this earth that his eyebrows will begin to droop. And the second person that will rule the most of this earth is Amir al Because both of these individuals, their right was taken to such an extent that never has such dhulm ever taken place on this earth. This concept of Raja is of course very controversial. Raja, for example, Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa was a outward uh, dejector and rejector of Raja. And for example, you find companions such as Jabir bin Yazid al Jafi. Jabir bin Yazid al Jafi, of course, he was a Mukhlis companion of the Fifth Imam. And Abu Hanifa once made a joke. Abu Hanifa said, Look, I, I'll give you this money. Uh, I'll, um, Jabir gave him money. He said, Look, if I am alive, I'll give it back. Otherwise, I'll give it back to you in Raja. He was taking the nick. So Jabir bin Yazid was, uh, uh, replied, Yes, you'll come back in Raja, but how do I know that you'll come back in human form? You could come back in the form of a joke. Give me my money. Jabir bin Yazid Jukti was a firm teacher, propagator of Raja, this concept. However, one side of the Muslimin, they're completely against it. However, we find proof, that's another topic. But Raja is the second stage. After the whole of Imam Mahdi, what comes next? This concept of Raja, when each one of the Imams will rule on this earth, so that this earth will see the rightful governorship of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam. That's the second stage. The third stage, then, is what's known as Qiyam. So before any of this straight away, the whole world will be destroyed. We understand that there is a long process. Those Imams and Infallibles will rule for a very long time. So it cannot be that the world will end like that. It will be extended out for a long time. Qiyamah, very interesting. One of the last things I'll say. Qiyamah, with regards to Qiyamah. Rasulullah was sitting with Jibra'i. He was sitting with Jibra'i. And uh, Jibra'i suddenly looked to the skies. He looked at the skies, his face turned, his expression turned. He became very worried, he began shivering. He looked at Rasulullah. Rasulullah looked at the skies, he saw that there was this angel whose wings covered both the east and the west of the world. In other words, his, the wings encapsulated the whole world. This angel descended down to the Prophet and said, O oh Prophet of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking, would you rather have prophethood and slavery or prophethood and kingship? Rasulullah said, of course, I would rather have prophethood and slavery. That angel then, it is said that he would put his feet on each of the heavens, so he put his foot on uh, the first heaven, and then he would put his other foot on the second heaven and he would climb the heavens and he would get smaller and smaller and smaller, this angel. And he descended back on into the seventh heaven. Jibra'il then looked at Rasulullah. Rasulullah said, why were you scared of him? The reply came, he is Israfil. I was scared that he was coming here to announce Qiyam. For Jibra'il many times, for example, when Isa sallallahu said to Jibra'il, oh Jibra'il, when do you think Qiyam will come? Jibra'il was so shocked, he fainted. Jibra'il fainted. Then when he regained consciousness, he said, Oh, Ruh Allah, you know better when Qiyam will come, I am too scared to talk about this Yawm al Qiyam. There are many different theories with the Gazi Ramad Yawm al Qiyam. One of the theories is this, that all of the believers on the earth during Yawm al Qiyam, a very light wind will pass through the world. And all of the believers will die very easily. Then die very quickly. Then the earth will be inhabited by people whose moral character wasn't good. By people that sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned throughout. These people will then fear the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then their world will be destroyed. But the good people will have gone from this earth in a nice and easy manner. 
So when we hear of these myths of apocalyptic wars and people saying that, look, World War II, the whole World War Three, the whole world will be demolished, all of the good and bad and inhabitants of this world will be destroyed in a gruesome way. We understand, though, there are three stages. The first is one we are waiting for most adamantly, and that is the war of the Imam. Very quickly, just to give a message, I want to finish with one last story. During the time of the Shah, in the, uh, Iran, there was, of course, the Shah, of course, he was against the ulama, those with the uh, turbans, etc. And so anyone who would wear a turban or clerical clothing within the streets, within public places, the people would make a mockery of him. And the people would abuse him. And so it wasn't safe for them to go out in their clerical clothes. One scholar says, I was going to a certain place by coach, and I was wearing my amal and everything. I entered, I sat down, next to me came this youth. Now this youth, he looked like a very unreligious youth. Spiky hair, everything. He didn't look like a religious person. So I thought, look, he's going to do something to me because I've got my amama on, he's going to make fun of me, abuse me, something will happen. The scholar says, I sat. When the time of the came, as we were traveling, when the time of the came, this youth suddenly got up. He went right to the front of the uh, coach to the coach driver and said, I need you to stop this coach now for the Hassan. <coughs> this Alim says, I was thinking, this youth, he looks unreligious, he wants to pray on time. This youth was persistent. He said, Look, I want to pray now, you have to stop this coach now, I need to pray. He persisted and persisted and persisted. Then this Alim came and this Alim said to the driver, Look, we need to pray, allow us to pray. Then we can continue the journey. So they stopped the coach. When they got off the coach, this alim says to this youth, he says, primarily I am sorry because I did not act in a comfortable way with you because I thought you would abuse me because of my amal. Secondly, I want, you to, I want to ask you this question. Why is it that you are so adamant on praying salah on dot? 105, 105, not 106, 105. He says this person replied, he says, my family are the richest, one of the richest within Tehran. One of the richest families. There was no religiosity, but they were one of the really, uh, richest families. My parents paid for my uh, schooling within Paris. I was studying medicine within Paris when it came to my final exam. The morning of my final exam, of course, I was nervous. We left together in a coach or in a bus. Halfway through the journey, the bus driver told us that, look, there's been a puncture, you won't be able to go anywhere for the next hour. I was worried, I said, look, my exam's in the next half an hour, it's not walking distance, what are we going to do? The driver said, look, forget medicine, forget everything. There's nothing I can do, there's a puncture. This person, this Dehrani youth said, look, I remember it that my grandmother, she was religious. Everyone else in my family, they were not religious. My grandmother, she was religious. And she would call out a certain name. She would call out Ya Sahib al-Zaman. I didn't know who he was. I had just heard of this name, Ya Sahib al-Zaman. So I called up, what did he call out? He called out Ya Sahib al-Zaman Jeddah. O Sahib al-Zaman of my grandmother. Not mine, I don't know you. Who are you? I don't know. But I'm calling out to you. He says, as I called out to this personality that I didn't know, I said, if you allow my problem to be resolved, I will always pray on God. And I will never break this promise. This youth says, suddenly, the driver came to us and said, someone has come and fix this. I got off the coach and I saw this individual, his face covered in light. He said to me, do one thing, son, don't forget your promise. Which is why whenever, wherever I am, when the time of Salah comes, I pray. This person didn't even know the Imam, but because he had promised to pray on time, because he had promised to do one of the most praiseworthy acts, Imam Zaman himself came in. In order to understand the Imam better, in order to gain Ma'rifah, in order for him to come quickly and hasten his reappearance, we need to leave these small little things, such as not praying on time, such as listening to music, such as these small sins which act as veils in front of us, making us further and further and further from the Imam, 
that when there are rumors such as apocalyptic wars, when there are rumors such as the Imam's son has risen, when there are rumors such as the Imam has risen in such country, we are able to put them away because we have this true cognizance of the Imam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Allahumma khrin al-Mu'mineen wal-Mu'minat wal-Muslimin wal-Muslimat al-Ahyai minhum wal-Amwat ta'bih bainana wa bainuhum bil-Khayrat al-Nake Oh, uh-huh.